When an affluent entrepreneur and author died suddenly in Beaufort County, South Carolina on June 14th, 2017, the event spawned investigations, conspiracy theories, and all manner of questions. How did a head wound the size of a golf club iron manage to go unphotographed and undocumented in incident reports? Were the words posted on social media by a soon-to-be widow the night before her husband's death the same words which appeared on a funeral invitation the very next day of foreshadowing? Or did they point to something far worse? This perplexing tale stretches from the moss-draped oaks of Bluffton, South Carolina, to the sun-drenched streets of Boca Raton, Florida. It involves a man who was a towering figure in life and who left behind an estate valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. Jeffrey Hammond, known as Jeff to his friends and family, was a graduate of the Citadel, a founder of multi-million dollar corporations and the author of an espionage thriller. As it turns out, the final chapter of his life has all the elements of a best-selling fiction novel. Although that chapter isn't just a story, for his loved ones, it's a quest for truth. I'm Jen Wood, Research Director for Fitz News, and this is Unsolved Carolinas, The Unexplained Death of Jeffrey Hammond. Here's Callie Lyons with the story. Jeff Hammond's death came as a shock to nearly everyone who knew him, yet his wife and her sons did not appear at all surprised. The 69-year-old was in excellent physical condition. His sudden passing, which a pathologist attributed to arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease, did not make sense, least of all to his physician. This conclusion appears to have overlooked obvious signs of foul play. And so far, authorities seem disinclined to take another look at the evidence. A former vice president with AT&T, Hammond later founded Consolidated Services Incorporated, a Florida-based facilities management company with annual revenues estimated at more than $73 million. He was the publisher of International Opulence, a luxury lifestyle magazine. In 2012, he published his first book, The Last Con. A sequel was in the works when he passed away. The Bluffton residence where Hammond died was a second home. His permanent residence was a $6 million home in Meisner Lake Estates, near the Boca Resort in Boca Raton, Florida. In addition to business interests and properties, Hammond owned four vessels, two Harley-Davidsons, an enviable fleet of automobiles, including a Ferrari and a Maserati, and an art collection valued at $4 million. At the time of his death, his estate was worth more than $300 million. Jeff's wife, Jane Hammond, told police she was the only other person at the Hanover Way address that late spring day when her husband was said to have collapsed and died. Calling 911, Jane said her husband was on the floor and that she was not able to roll him over to administer cardiopulmonary resuscitation. When asked, Jane said she was not able to tell if her husband was breathing or if he had a pulse. Those comments seemed strange coming from someone whose biography on CSI's corporate website touted her experience as a registered nurse who graduated from UCLA. Now, one major emergency. <laughs> What's the address? Twelve Hanover Way in Collison River. Okay, and that was Twelve Hanover Way. And is he breathing? I can't tell. I don't think so. Okay, how is your husband, ma'am? Um, sixty-nine. Sixty-nine. Did he have any medical problems? No. As emergency personnel arrived six minutes later, they were greeted by the security chief from Colleton River Club, who guided first responders to Jeff's location on the third floor. Despite attempts by the Bluffton Fire Department and Beaufort County EMS to resuscitate Jeff, his heart had stopped. He was pronounced dead. The Beaufort County Sheriff's Office also responded to the scene, as did the deputy coroner. No one took photographs of the death scene, and reports vary as to the details. The fire department report mentions an unintentional injury without further explanation. 
The EMS report said Jeff had cyanosis, or a bluish coloring of the skin linked to oxygen deprivation, from his clavicles to his head. A death scene questionnaire filled out by responding deputies said blood was coming from his nose. The deputy coroner noted inconsistencies in Jane's comments. Jane told the deputy coroner that Jeff had gone up to his third floor office to crunch numbers. The former military man was a creature of habit. He rose early, dressed, and had coffee and breakfast every day. But he was found in the shorts he wore to bed, in an office that was clean and undisturbed. There was no evidence of him working on anything. The coroner requested an autopsy. On the certificate of death dated two days later, the cause was listed as pending toxicology and autopsy results, while the manner of death was cited as pending investigation. As for the sheriff's office, it closed its investigation the day after Jeff died, without reviewing the results of the autopsy. Investigators were not the only ones moving quickly. By 5.38 p.m. on June the 15th, 2017, Jeff's memorial card had already been printed. There was a significant and obvious injury that was not documented in any of the reports from first responders, BCSO, or the coroner's office. A gash on Jeff Hammond's forehead. Loved ones who attended his wake and funeral reported being aghast at his appearance. Upon observing him in his coffin, they described a wound three to four inches long at an angle towards his hairline, with an indentation a quarter inch deep surrounded by bruising. Individuals who were interviewed by Fitz News remarked that the injury was the size and shape of a golf club iron. Based on photos shared with Fitz News during our investigation, this is an accurate description. The autopsy report was the first to mention the vicious looking wound. However, no measurements were provided and there was no further investigation into the cause of the injury or its potential impact on his death. No photographs were taken of the injury during the autopsy, according to BCSO. The dimensions of the narrow carpeted office and placement of the office furniture make it highly unlikely that Jeff, who stood six feet four inches tall, could have struck his head during a fall in such a way as to cause the injury. Furthermore, head wounds bleed profusely. The gash on Jeff's head, if sustained in his office during a collapse, would have left obvious evidence. Yet, he was found in a prone position in a room described as clean and undisturbed. There is no mention of him lying in a pool of blood or being covered in blood from the injury. The bruising observed around the injury and the statement that he had blood coming from his nose point to him being alive when it happened. Yet, authorities were not suspicious. The home was not searched. The room where Jeff was found was not assessed as a possible crime scene. There was sufficient irregularities that could have caused any number of people to look further, but no one did. In the aftermath of Jeff Hammond's death, his adult daughter and only biological child, Tara Hammond Hellman, tried to make sense of the unexpected loss that took place on her birthday. Grieving, devastated, and seeking answers, Hellman and Jeff's siblings asked Jane Hammond for access to Jeff's medical history and for information related to his cause of death. Their requests were denied. Jane's refusal to share Jeff's medical records, which later became a matter of court record, was not necessarily surprising. There had always been tension between Jane and Tara. Further confusing the matter, friends and family members were given different accounts of the events that transpired on the morning he died. Jeff was the oldest of six children, and his siblings, who were also in a state of shock over his death, found Jane's conflicting statements about the place and the cause of his death puzzling, to say the least. As she told it, the place he collapsed varied to include his home office, his bed, exercise bike, the basement, and the yard. Roger Pinckney, a Dufusky Island author and one of Jeff's close friends, was told him and died peacefully, that he was laid out on the floor, arms crossed, with a smile on his face. The gash on his head wasn't mentioned. When he learned otherwise, many things about the circumstances surrounding Jeff's death did not seem to add up. 
Pinckney shared his thoughts with Fitz News in an interview conducted in March, less than two weeks prior to his own death on April the 3rd, 2024. When the investigation into Jeff's death stalled, it was Pinckney who suggested Hellman reach out to Fitz News. For Pinckney, the situation brought to mind other unsolved Beaufort County cases, like the 2008 disappearance of John and Elizabeth Calvert, and the subsequent death of their accountant, Dennis Gerwing. I've been dealing with the Sheriff's Department um, a lot. Uh, they've got a, a long-standing interest in the, in the Calvert affair over there in Harbor Town. And uh, it was just a complete whitewash as far as I was concerned. You know, my father was county coroner for 36 years. And he was unimpeachable, unshakable. He could turn that man around. And he would have never let something like that slide. The Calverts went missing from Hilton Head Island in March 2008 and have not been seen or heard from since. Days later, Gerwing, who deprived them of millions of dollars, died of 17 knife wounds, which authorities determined to be a suicide. It was a crime Pinckney said he thought about every day. Pinckney strongly believed there was a financial motive for someone to cause Jeff's death. He pointed to the 911 call as evidence something was amiss. One consistent part of the story Jane shared about her husband's death was she was alone when he collapsed. Nonetheless, other voices can be heard on the audio recording of the 911 call, and no attempt has been made to identify or interview those potential witnesses. Less than 12 hours before calling 911 on the night before Jeff died, Jane posted something on Facebook that would figure prominently in his funeral arrangements. Death leaves a heartache no one can heal. Love leaves a memory no one can steal. These same words appeared on Jeff's funeral notification and memorial card. Was this some bizarre premonition, a strange coincidence, or potentially part of something more sinister? The doubts of friends and family members were further intensified by Jane's handling of the funeral arrangements. Instead of involving relatives, Jane contacted her personal jeweler in Florida. Much to the dismay of his family, Jeff, who was always a classy dresser, was wearing clothes that appeared tattered, and as mentioned, he had an enormous unexplained gash on his head. Adding insult to injury, his family was in a state of uncomfortable disbelief when the memorial service for Jeff, who was a Catholic, was held in a dilapidated Jewish cemetery with a hideous past. In 2003, Menorah Gardens and Funeral Homes in Florida paid out $100 million to settle a lawsuit alleging their South Florida cemeteries oversold plots, misplaced the dead, and tossed bones into the woods. Such was their reputation. As recently as 2016, they were sued for burying people of other faiths alongside people of Jewish faith, in defiance of Jewish tradition and unbeknownst to the loved ones making the arrangements. It was clear to family members that Jeff was not the one who selected his final resting place. In interviews with Fitz News, they said it was like a big middle finger disrespecting the man they loved and admired. Those who were present at Jeff's memorial service believed something was very wrong and something dreadful happened to cause his sudden and unexpected death. Further bolstering these suspicions was a series of events that occurred around the same time because within days, the house and the car that Jeff loved and the businesses he worked so hard to build were in the hands of people he did not like or trust. After his passing, Hellman reached out to her stepmother to ask for a personal possession of her father's, a memento to remember him by. Jane initially offered Hellman Jeff's Letterman sweater. She said she would leave the sweater with her son in Florida so Hellman could pick it up. Minutes later, Jane scolded Tara for not inquiring about how Jane was doing. She called Hellman's tears at the funeral phony and rescinded the offer of the Letterman sweater. When Hellman received a copy of her father's will several weeks later, it was delivered by the corporate attorney employed by Jane, not the attorney who drafted the will for Jeff. 
Not only was Hellman inexplicably left out of his will, but so was every other living member of his biological family. The only beneficiaries were Jane and her two sons from two prior marriages. Hellman became painfully aware that she needed someone to independently investigate the circumstances surrounding her father's death. Watching Dateline in December 2018, Hellman admired the way private investigator Joseph DeLue found answers for the family of Chris Smith, a missing entrepreneur. The Dateline episode featuring the retired police detective was entitled In a Lonely Place. Hellman reached out to DeLue at his agency, Premier Group International, but her expectations were low. If he responded at all, she hoped he would refer her to someone closer to her Florida home who would look for answers. To her surprise, Delu took her case pro bono and traveled to South Carolina and Florida in pursuit of the answers to her questions. By that time, Jane had moved out of the Bluffton home and put it up for sale. So Delu contacted a real estate agent and arranged to view the house at 12 Hanover Way. The house was mostly empty. However, Delu made an upsetting discovery. In the closet of the master bedroom, Delu found Jeff's Letterman sweater, left behind with a couple of pairs of shoes. Valu's comprehensive investigation is documented in a 75-page report with exhibits, interview summaries, expert analysis, a timeline of related events, and a list of recommendations. Without this report, Fitz News would not have been able to do such a deep dive on this case. Dalu uncovered evidence of criminal violations committed in both South Carolina and Florida. Homicide, conspiracy to commit homicide for financial gain, fraud, forgery, and tax evasion. In September of 2020, Dalu provided all the relevant information to BCSO in a meeting with Detective Seth Reynolds. He came to the meeting armed with two binders full of supporting documentation. Dalu's report cited a trail of public records that revealed how the redistribution of the estate began days before Jeff's death, when unbeknownst to him and without his authorization, the corporation he founded changed banks. This released the Hammond's Boca Raton home from obligation. It had been held as collateral on the corporate line of credit. The person who made the change in bank accounts was David Hammond, Jeff's adopted son and Jane's oldest son from a prior marriage. David had previously been fired from the company by Jeff against Jane's protest. Dalu's report alleges this is because he was an ever-increasing liability. Court records show multiple sexual harassment lawsuits were filed against Hammond and CSI by former female employees. A wrongful death lawsuit also contributed to the corporation's mounting legal bills and settlement expenses. Yet days after Jeff's death, David moved into his office and took over. Sources told Fitz News Jeff would never have trusted David to change the bank accounts or assume leadership of the business. The alleged financial ruse continued with the sale of the book upon property six days after Jeff died and three days after his funeral. The property was purchased by a limited liability company created by David Rosenberg, Jane's personal jeweler, the same person who planned Jeff's funeral. Business insiders were aware that a rift between Jeff and Rosenberg two months prior to his death resulted in Jeff banning Rosenberg from advertising in the pages of his magazine or attending any of the glamorous exclusive parties hosted by international opulence. In interviews with Fitz News, they said Jeff would never have allowed Rosenberg to plan his funeral or take over the ownership of his beloved Ferrari in the palatial Boca Raton home he had no intention of selling. Ironically, Dalu located some of the details of this questionable transaction in the 2017 fall and winter editions of International Opulence magazine. The edition released after Jeff's passing included a six-page spread about Rosenberg, the self-proclaimed international Iceman, who had been banned from the magazine just four months earlier. 
The deal for the Meisner Lake Estates real estate is represented on paper as a financial transaction in which $2.7 million was paid for the property. However, Deleuze's investigation revealed that Jane exchanged the house and Jeff's prized 2008 Ferrari, valued at $263,000, for the $2.7 million and a rare diamond, the heart of Maldives, valued at several million dollars. Deleuze's report details how the parties appear to have artificially undervalued the house and skirted payment of hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions and taxes. The information provided to BCSO by Deleuze was also provided to the Boca Raton police so they could pursue evidence of crimes within their jurisdiction, fraud, forgery, and tax evasion. Boca Raton police reasoned that, as the surviving spouse, Jane had the legal authority to assume ownership of the Hammond's primary residence and to sell it under whatever terms she deemed appropriate. Overlooking the expert analysis of forensic document examiner Dr. Roy Fanoff, who detected a number of apparent forgeries, including the Ferrari title, police determined the allegations were invalid based on Jane's statement that the documents in question were signed by Jeff in Florida on June the 10th, 2017. Jane's statement was supported by a similar statement from Rosenberg. Had they taken steps to verify this information, investigators would have learned that the Hammonds were in South Carolina on that day. June in Florida was much too hot, and sources have confirmed the couple's presence in South Carolina. Since they did not detect the deception, the Boca Raton police looked no further, and the case was closed. In February, as Fitz News began to investigate this case, we sent a Freedom of Information request to the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office requesting the investigative file. The following day, we received a redacted copy of two pages of the incident report and were advised nothing further could be provided about the active investigation. Two weeks later, as Fitz News was about to release a story about Jeff's death, BCSO announced it would be closing the investigation and releasing the file. This announcement came as a surprise to Hellman and Dalu, who were not notified that the case was to be closed. When they last sat down with detectives to discuss the case, there were plans to obtain new evidence. The report from BCSO documents how the case, which had been closed the day after Jeff's death, was reopened following an initial meeting with Hellman and Dalu in 2020. Subsequently, Detectives found there was sufficient probable cause to pursue a search warrant for phone records. There was also talk of pursuing exhumation so a second autopsy could be performed to establish the cause of death. At that point, detectives agreed there was little information available, and at least a few reasons to be suspicious. The main concerns identified by detectives include questions about Jeff's will and whether it had been altered, a lack of information about the death scene, problems with the autopsy report, and the mysterious 911 call. It also took note of inconsistencies in statements made by Jane. Despite concerns over the authenticity of the will, including Fenoff's assessment that the document provided to the probate court was not an intact original will, the expert analysis was dismissed and BCSO determined these allegations were not within their jurisdiction. In the report, Reynolds said he could hear the sound of other voices in the audio recording of the 911 call, but efforts to identify those voices were abandoned. The potential witnesses were never interviewed. One day after advising Fitz News that the investigation was to be closed as unfounded, Reynolds interviewed Jane for the first time over the phone, advising her of our FOIA request. Unsurprisingly, that interview yielded no new information about the case. Ultimately, despite all the questions about the death scene, the autopsy, and the 911 call, Reynolds concluded there was not sufficient evidence to continue the investigation into Jeff Hammond's death. As for the evidence of other alleged criminal activity provided by Dalu, BCSO determined such matters did not lie within its jurisdiction. In March of 2022, 
a second meeting took place between detectives Dalu and Hellman and three other individuals. Not only is the second meeting not documented in the file, two of the individuals who provided statements were not named. BCSO also failed to note the reason behind their sudden change in direction. The last email Hellman received from Reynolds said he was working out the logistics of exhuming Josh remains for a second autopsy to determine the cause of death. After that, communication ceased. Questions have also been raised about the original autopsy performed by Dr. Nicholas Batalis at the Medical University of South Carolina. Only three photos from the autopsy were made available, none of which depict Jeff's head injury. They do show an individual fully clothed, which is odd because Jeff was only wearing shorts at the time of his death. Fitz News reached out to Coroner David Ott on three occasions, asking for information about the autopsy report. As the deputy coroner, it was Ott who visited the scene on the day of Jeff's death. Since that time, he's been elected to the office of county coroner. So far, we've received no response. Further, three independent medical experts reviewed the autopsy and found it lacking, particularly as it relates to the stated cause of death, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The disease alone is not a cause of death. It requires a mechanism like a stroke or heart attack to become fatal. No such mechanism is named or suspected in Jeff's case. Instead, medical experts concluded Jeff suffered a cardiac arrest, which may have been the result of at least one of three specific medical events, asphyxiation, poison, or the result of blunt force trauma. One of the individuals that was present at the March 2022 meeting with detectives was troubled to learn that some important parts of his statement were missing from the agency's investigative report. David Broom was the Hammond's Bluffton handyman, and over the years he worked for Jeff, the two became friends. Broom was informed of Jeff's death in a phone call from Jane. Near the end, well, right at the end of the phone call with her, she said they have to do an autopsy on him to make sure that I didn't kill him. Just like I, told, like I said to you just then. Now, that struck me as real bad wrong. When Jane called me about his death to inform me he had died, it was an actual phone call from her who used his phone. And I said, hey, how you doing, Bo? Uh, what's, what's going on, brother? You know, stuff like that, that we always talk like that. And she said, no, it's not, not Jeff, it's Jane. I said, what's going on? He began to tell me, you know, the whole smear. She said the, the um, EMS told her it was more than likely an aneurysm. I don't know, you know, the situation or whatever, but that's what she said. She showed no emotion on the phone whatsoever. I mean, it was just like stone cold. In his interview with detectives, Broom shared his suspicions about Jane Hammond, including specific allegations relating to her potential involvement in his death. These allegations were included in the BCSO report. However, Broom also told detectives about a series of trap doors in hidden passageways located throughout the Hanover Way home. Doors and passageways that would have enabled someone to hide or move from room to room undetected. One such passageway was in Jeff's office. Well, I'll tell you exactly where they're at. He's in Jeff's office where they found him at. It's underneath the desk where you slide up to the desk. There's a trap door under there that goes into a place plenty big enough for two or three people easy. It's got the more one of the water heaters in it. And then the other one is at the end of the hall on the same floor in the back bathroom. It's a linen closet and it's big enough for 
five or six people. I mean, you know, there's a pretty good sized area behind that door. And who could that someone have been? The Premier Group's investigative report named Jane Hammond's second son, Todd Patterson, as a possible co-conspirator in Jeff Hammond's death, raising a host of allegations related to the nature of his relationship with the late entrepreneur, as well as his proximity to the home at the time of Jeff's death. Be on the lookout for a follow-up report related to this aspect of the investigation. Broom and others are left with an abiding conviction that the investigation should have gone further. Specifically, Broom believes there are too many red flags for detectives to close the investigation without an exhumation and second autopsy. Unsolved Carolinas, sponsored by our friends at Bamberg Legal, is a series by Fitz News devoted to shining a spotlight on cases which have fallen off the front page. We hope to tell the stories of those individuals who are seeking answers and justice on behalf of their lost loved ones. We will dive deeper into their stories, get to know them through their families and friends, and hopefully help find answers for those they've left behind. In every unsolved case, someone out there could know something that provides a missing link, a critical clue that could bring peace to a family in pain and help them write the next chapter of their stories even if it is the final chapter. If you know someone who's missing or has been a victim of an unsolved homicide, email their story to research at fitznews.com. The more stories we share, the more hope we can spread.